welcome everyone. I'm Michelle Schumann. I'm the Artistic Director of the Austin Chamber Music Center. Uh, we're getting ready for our Austin Chamber Music Festival coming up this July, and I'm really happy to be here with Andrew Bulbrook. He is the violinist with the Calder String Quartet. Um, and I have been really excited to, to have the Calder Quartet come to the festival for years. I've been trying to book you for a long time. You guys are always very busy and it doesn't hasn't aligned yet. But in the meantime, it's been really great for me to kind of uh, see the trajectory of your career because the career of the quartet has just taken off in an amazing way. Um, you guys have performed all around the world. You've won tons of prizes. And I think what's really exciting is that I feel like you really embody um, you know, you're, tr you're a truly 21st century quartet. Um, you have a super diversified career. Um, you perform classical concerts featuring the standard repertoire, but then you also champion new music. You perform with rock bands like The National. Um, you're equally comfortable in concert halls and playing with orchestras like Cleveland Orchestra. Uh, and you're also comfortable in alternative uh, venues and clubs. Uh, tell me, what motivates you, uh, motivates the quartet when you're accepting new creative projects and when you're deciding what to do and um, what, what is kind of the, the reason behind this incredible diversification? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's really just comes down to following our, our interests. And the more you do something, the more depth you get, the more, uh, the more paths there are to go down. And we've been doing this for 15 years and we, we live in California. We live in Los Angeles. Um, it's not maybe the same as living in New York or in Boston or in Cleveland. Um, and so I think that's probably like a, a big part of the influence that we've had the chance to just kind of evolve and follow our interests. And everybody in the group has a really diverse set of interests. And, and uh, so that's kind of manifested itself in all of this wild stuff starting to happen. Well, and that's one of the things that I kind of love about the Calders too, is that you are based in, in California. You've got a kitty there. We can, should we introduce everyone to your kitty? Aw. <laughs> Sully is on the YouTube. Yeah. Very she's going to step on the computer in about two seconds and shut this interview down. <laughs> uh, well, she, that's all she wanted. She wanted to be a part of this interview. It, it wasn't enough to yeah. just be down. Well, she, she really wants to close the video function of your so badly. Like, that's... A quick command you to like wherever right. she's gonna quick command you to. <laughs> she's a master at quick commands. This girl. A master, master. Well, we'll, we'll see if we can survive uh, this, yeah. this interview. Oh my goodness! What, Sorry for that. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. But what I really love is that you are from the West Coast, and it seems like so much of chamber music is dominated by East Coast musicians. And I mean, I, I feel it sort of every year. It just feels like it's just everyone's from New York City. And I think that with you guys being on the West Coast, you really have embodied a different spirit and brought a different spirit to the quartet. And I think it's really, people are really taking notice of that. And I think everyone needs to understand too that chamber music doesn't just happen on one coast and it doesn't actually only happen on two coasts either. It, there's really great stuff happening uh, across the country. So, so I love that you've kind of embodied that spirit. And I think it's a great combination for Austin too, because Austin is another one of these really diverse Mm -hmm. Did I lose? Oh, I thought I lost you, but there you are. No, I'm here. It's another one of those very diverse uh, places where the uh, the classical musicians here they do a huge variety of things, and there's a big live music scene here, so mm -hmm. people are really uh, collaborating at on all levels, and I think it really helps musicians really inform each other on the classical end and also uh, in in a new music end and also in uh, popular music too. So I think you got, mm -hmm. were in Austin, we did Southwest Southwest. I think right. You were part of the crazy. Then that was recently, right? When were you, when did you it do might Southwest? Been three years ago. We, yeah. I think we played, um, we sat in with a band at Stubbs Barbecue uh -huh. <laughs> and, and we also, um, we also played, there's a pizza place that does shows, uh -huh. it was called, we sat with our friends Lord Huron at this pizza restaurant, and then um, we did a sort of classical contemporary show at, um, there's a comedy club on like right. the main drag, yeah. like yeah. cheese in the name, something about cheese or something. I, uh, yeah, 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 the, the Velveeta Club. Yeah, yeah, there we go, right. I'm not far off. Right? <laughs> close. Yeah, I'm very, very close, yeah, so that was the last time we came to Austin, yeah. that was fun. Yeah, well, it's a great it's a great community for collaboration. People get excited about people doing different things. So the quartet just won the 2014 Avery Fisher Career Grant, and I feel like this is always 
um, such an a, a important marker of the great performing artists of our time in the U.S. Can you tell our audiences a little bit about that award and how people win it and, um, and what it means for the quartet? Mm -hmm. Well, it's one of those awards that you don't apply for. It, it finds you, which is kind of a nice, it's a nice thing to just get the uh, the phone call out of the blue. You know, I, I like those more than I I like having to go somewhere and, and compete <laughs> and compete. Yeah, it's it's kind of nice because it feels like people have been watching you and watching what you do, and there is a committee, and it's neat. After you win it, you realize like, oh wow. I know a lot of the people on this committee <laughs> and I've worked with them and, you know, they put on this concert or they did this. And, um, so that felt really nice. Like it was, it wasn't, um, a snapshot of how you did one day in, you know, one round, but it was a lot of people that had been paying attention to what you do for a little while. So that felt really good. It was, yeah. it was, um, yeah, it's a really special thing. And, you know, honestly, we the thing that's kind of intense for us is we had never really won any awards ever. You know, I mean, we've, we, we've done a few competitions a long time ago, but um, it was kind of nice to get something like this. It's sort of really our only award. <laughs> and, and again, you know, how, it's kind of, kind of an amazing thing. Well, and how refreshing that is, too, because it seems that sometimes the only way in for a quartet or a pianist or any performing artist is to win a major competition in a way. And I feel like that that's driving so many artists in the beginning of their career. And I don't know that that's the healthiest way to, to begin a career and to begin what you want to be doing. In fact, I think it can even pigeonhole you into a certain repertoire that, you're, that you can be successful at. And I think that that probably has a lot to say for for why the Calder Quartet is so diversified is that you didn't, you never got stuck into that hole of you play this the best and so you should do do that all the time. And and also so nice and refreshing to hear that someone like, you know, your quartet can have such a huge impact on the performing scene and be so successful without having to have that little prize or that, you know, win this particular competition. It, honestly, it just, it, it makes my heart warm. <laughs> gives yes. me, you know, uh, uh, it gives me confidence in the future of musical humanity. <laughs> well, I think those, I think competitions, they, they are really, they're really valuable. I mean, you do, if you don't have, concerts going on it really gives you a chance to perform it gives you a chance to be seen by people it does lead to opportunities you know and and gets things going i mean for us the thing that that helped us probably in a similar way to competitions uh was new music and our composer relationships and and we were very lucky that very early on some some high level composers really took interest in the way we played their music. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, doors were able to open because of those composers, either there's a festival of their music somewhere and they say, you know, it has to be the caller quartet that right. plays my music there. So it, that kind of had a similar function for us, maybe as competitions did um, yeah. for, for other people. Yeah. Well, and, and talking about new music, about new music, um, can you tell me about some experiences that you've had that were really great experiences with new works com combined with the audiences that you played for? Because as you know, and I'm sure you've come across this too, sometimes audiences are scared about new music before they've even heard anything. So they're, they have a sort of nervous sense. Um, can you share any experiences that you've had that were just, that kind of blew audiences away um, that, that you kind of felt were palp palpable in that way? Oh, I mean, they happen not infrequently, but the last one was we were playing at Wigmore Hall in London a month ago or six weeks ago or whenever it was. Um, and there was quite a bit of back and forth about the one contemporary piece on the program and, you know, not not wanting to push the audience too much or anything like that. And it was neat that in that concert that I think that piece got the loudest applause of, of anything, you know, and definitely, <laughs> I mean, there was good applause at the end of the whole thing, but, yeah. but it was like a very visceral, very strong, strong reaction 
from the from the audience, which I, I thought was interesting. That the I think we had resolved not to even print that in the brochure because it might look too contemporary. And then and then live, it was actually mm-hmm. maybe the highlight of the show. Isn't that amazing? And it just has to do with people's fear and maybe that fear is substantiated maybe people have had bad experiences and that i mean that I, I don't want to discount that at all but you know we want to get people to to concerts so that they can hear this great music but you have to get them to trust you um a little bit and can i get you to move a little bit forward so i can see your head a little bit? oh that that's even better thanks um so so but you know, if we can get them in the audience then we can be able to share this kind of great experience with them with a new work that is that can be emotionally stirring. So it's it's just really great to, to see that. And um, well, contemporary music is it's like um, when you are a classical performer. We talked about the competition. So there's there's a certain bar you need to play at a certain level of, of craft and and understanding of how to interpret different eras, different composers. A part of the artistry that's maybe not talked about as much is that you really are a curator and your, your role is to curate the music you play and with contemporary music that gets trickier. I mean, if you go to look at a lot of contemporary art and you haven't looked at it for much at all, you, you really have no idea what's good and what isn't. Right. right. You know, it might be the thing that is the least taxing on your eyes is what you're drawn to, but is that actually what's any good? Right. Right. You know, and, yeah. and it's a similar kind of thing with contemporary music. A lot of it's written, not all of it's good. Yeah. A lot of it is very good. Yeah. You know, and and so you have to sort of you have to make decisions. And I think, and and then you have the the extra element, which is you have to pick music that's good, and then you have to play it with the same focus and study that you would play Beethoven or yep. Brahms or whatever. And I'm not sure that's always fully realized for an audience. Yeah. The combination of picking picking things that are really good, yeah. and then rendering them with the same love and attention that you would put into something you've been playing for ten or twenty years. So for us, I think we're going to play Thomas Addis for you guys. Yes, yeah. yeah. All right. So we just finished recording all of his string chamber music with him in London uh, on that same trip as Wigmore. Mm-hmm. We've been playing these pieces for ten years. You know, maybe 12 years. Yeah. We performed it for him, I don't know, eight times. I mean, it's the most special thing in the world to have him coaching you, working on it. And then to have a, a piece have an evolution the same way your late Beethoven would, where you start it and you're going to play it for 30 years and it's going to grow and it's going to be different when you're 50 than when you're 30 than when you're 25. Mm-hmm. And to sort of take a piece like we're doing Arcadiana for yes. you guys. Yes. Yeah. So we started that when we were 25 and we're 34. You know, we've we spent a lot of time with it. It is it's one of the great great works. And what's cool about it too is that it it's a pivot piece. It it references so many things, it goes so many different directions. So it's got the ability to, to tie into Schubert. Yes, Schubert yeah. Death and the Maiden, and also you're doing intimate letters. Uh, right, right. Perfect. Janicek. So yeah, yeah. Janacek is one of Tom's absolute favorite composers. You know, I am talking to him about Janacek operas. He heard us play this exact quartet of Wigmore. A lot of the structures, a lot of the colors, timbral things, emotional things, he's he's paying attention to that in his music. And he's referencing maybe some some things melodically at times here and there as well. Um Schubert is a really obvious reference. Arcadia on his third movement takes its title from a Schubert song um, about water. And then Tom takes the water reference a few degrees further by creating a dripping motif at the beginning that starts to boil. Mm-hmm. So, and it's fun to think, you know, you don't, there aren't too many museums out there where they have both contemporary art and old masters. And it's kind of an interesting mm-hmm. curatorial thing, you know, the idea of, could you put, you know, some ultra contemporary piece of art or music next to something that's 300 years old? And how do the two dialogue and how do they, they play to each other? And how do you, how do you hear things differently from having the experience of, 
of hearing them both together. So I think that's a little bit what we we're trying to explore with you guys with this concert is is that pathway. Yeah. And I think that that's always an important thing is when we when we program music together and program pieces together, it's not really about displaying all the contrast that, that is there. The contrast will be evident, I think, to audiences. But it is about drawing the similarities and talking about what is what what makes these pieces actually close to each other. I've, I've done some programming with a Baroque music by Bach and I'm mm. pairing it together with Philip Glass. And you talk about this dialogue of like, what is similar about Baroque mm. and minimalist music? And there is a ton of similarities. Oh, you're that. right. And when you and when you talk to audiences in that way and kind of fill them in on on those ideas, then well, for one thing, it just makes things less scary for them. And once they're comfortable in that way, then they're willing to kind of listen to to what the possibilities are. To do you talk to your audiences? Uh, is that part of your um, or do you do program notes or what's your preferred way of of making that communication happen? Well, we talk. Yeah. Yeah. We usually talk about. We talk uh, maybe once or twice during the show, depending on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Well, we'll have you talk at our show, too. I, I usually, if I have a group that doesn't want to talk, I usually talk in between all the pieces just to, to oh, let oh. The, know, the, the audience um, what's kind of going on. And that helps with the curation. Because I know that all of the groups, they bring that idea of how do these pieces work together? How, what, what, why these pieces? It's not just a, these are three of my, you know, top favorite pieces and I want to play them together. That's not the thread <laughs> that binds them. Um, so, so I'm glad that you guys will be talking as because I know that our audiences, they absolutely love that, um, that education about what's behind the, the music and, and why they, the, the pieces work together. And it, it allows them to enjoy and listen to the music on a totally different level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it, I'm glad that convention is, is easing and that we talking is becoming more and more uh, accepted thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We could do something where we wouldn't talk in the big cities and we would only talk in, in, like, we wouldn't talk in New York and we wouldn't talk in, like, San Francisco and we wouldn't talk, and then we would talk in more regional concerts. Okay. And now I feel like in the last little bit, you can talk wherever. Yeah. And I don't know if that if I was if that's a change that has actually happened or one that I just had naturally evolved or something, but I felt like it actually Yeah, you you had to really be careful in the past. And now I think maybe everybody's seeing it as a positive thing that that opens the music to the the audience. Yeah. And in the 10 years that I've been um, programming and, and playing these concerts and chamber music concerts, because I'm a pianist as well, so I play a lot. Um, I've only had one person who sent me a very long email about how disturbing it is that there is talking during a concert and, and they, they went on and on. But that was only one person and I really didn't, you know, but there, I've had so many other comments from people who say that the, the um, the introductions really help them, you know, hear the music in a different way, and they are so grateful for it. I don't think we can take anything for granted with our with our audiences, and we shouldn't, right? You you've you just said that you've lived with the Thomas Addis piece, uh, the one that you're going to, going to be playing for nine years, and so you've been performing it. And um, how can we expect that when you when you come on stage that we're going to be there with you <laughs> with those nine years of experience, um, mm -hmm. like right, right from that first hearing? I, I think it's not necessarily uh, fair all the time. And, and I just think that audiences really appreciate that. Um, and to be able to get into the heads of the artists is, is a really great thing to do. Well, hey, thanks so much. Really good talking to you. Yeah, great talking to you, I, too. I should, I should run, but... Okay. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you have a great, great day too. We're looking forward to seeing you very soon.